Gus, Alex and George. They're going to tell us more about the road to mobile tour and improvement censorship circumvention. Please listen to the updates from The Onion. That's your stage. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Gus. I'm from the Tar Project. Uh, English is not my first language, so maybe you are going to uh, learn a little bit about Portuguese today, too. Uh, so we want to talk a little bit about Tor and what we are working in the last uh, months and year. So first thing about Tor is Tor is a free software. So you can download Tor, you can check the source code and everything. And this is very important to have a uh, a free software project because you can inspect the code and you can check the code. The second thing is about Tor, is about is an open network. So you can grab the source code and be part of the Tor network too. Uh, at the moment we have like 6,000 uh, relays. So it, it is servers around the world and they are all run by volunteers. And why we are going to use Tor? Basically we are going to use Tor to mitigate against online tracking, and against surveillance, against censorship, and to be safe online. And Tor is a non-profit based in the US, so uh, many of us, are, we don't live in the US, but Tor, uh, the headquarters of Tor is based on Seattle. And how do we spell Tor? It's like that, and it's not all caps. We changed that in the last uh, few years. It's not more Tor, the onion routing, it's just Tor. It's easier for us. And we are organized in, in different teams. I'm part of the community team, and, and we also have the anti-censorship anti team, applications, fundraising, metrics, network, sysadmin, UX, and research. And when we talk about Tor, we are talking about a network that is used by between 2 million and 8 million of people. And we have these numbers because first, we don't track the users, so we don't actually know how many people are connecting the Tor network. So these numbers are based, are based on two different methodologies to study the Tor network. And how Tor works? Basically, we have this network of Tor servers around the world. And when you want to enter your website, you are going to access three servers in the Tor network. So your you're not going to access directly the website. Your traffic is going to pass through three servers around the world. These servers that are uh, run by all volunteers. And at the moment, we have uh, uh, we are, the network is growing. So if we, if we have to, uh, old Tor users here, in the past years, we had a very slow connection using Tor. And nowadays, this connection is improving. It's, it's much more faster nowadays. And it's because we have more faster relays and more faster servers. And about the community team, uh, in the last uh, years, we have been working in doing trainings in the Global South. So for those that you are not familiar with trainings, Basically, it's an opportunity to meet the users and to talk about Tor, and not only about Tor, but about privacy, about security. So we have been doing uh, digital training security workshops uh, with uh, human rights defenders in the Global South. So in the last six months, we traveled to six countries, like Colombia, Kenya, India, Indonesia, and other countries. And we did 45 uh, workshops and each, each workshop usually takes like uh, three hours. So it's not just like, oh, you are going to install Tor browser and that's it, bye. But it's about what kind of questions do you have about privacy? What kind of questions do you have about security? And if Tor cannot help you, what we can do for you? What kind of other so free software solution we can present to you? So we have been doing this work in, in the last months and we, we are going to do more more Tor trainings in, in the next months. Uh, let's see. And another thing that we are doing, we released the new website. 
So now it's localized. As you can see, it's not in English anymore, only in English anymore. We have been, this is our priority on Tor. We need to have more users and we need to achieve this population that don't, don't speak English. So Tor is translated in many languages now, like in 12 languages. Languages, So you can access the Tor web page and you can change the language for what your preferred language. So here we have Tor, the main website translated to uh, Spanish. Navega con privacidad, explora libremente. E isso é me, uh, and this is my Spanish Portuñol. It's not a real Spanish. And we also have other portals that we are working on. We have the, the support portal. It's a portal to help our uh, users. And we are working in the community portal. So we are going to have the training slides so you can download and you can help your community. And also, we are going to have uh, the relay operator's documentation there and also how to localize the website and other things. And the next step, we are going to develop, we are going to start to code the new developer's web page that we don't have now. It was all mixed in the old portal, and we are, we are building different portals for that. And another thing that we are work, working is, uh, is, the doc, uh, is the Docs Hackathon. So because we are moving a lot of documentation in splitting different websites, we noticed that many of these documentation is old. So we need help to improve this documentation and to fix that. So in the first week of September, we are going to do a, doc, a documentation hackathon. It's open for, for all. And, and more details about that you can check in the blog in the Tor project. And basically, we, we already have uh, tickets about what you want to change. So we need, uh, you need to subscribe in the, in the hackathon and, and help us on that. And people that the, the, the top contributors will receive uh, an award. And that's it. Thanks, Gus. So, hi, I'm Geico. I'm working on the applications team, and they're mostly on Tor browser stuff. Um, as Tor browser is our uh, largest application, I think it's smart to spend some time on uh, what we did in the last couple of months and what is yet to come in the next couple of months. So, one big milestone uh, we had a couple of months earlier when releasing Tor browser 8.5 which brought for the first time a Tor browser to uh, Android devices. Uh, the nice folks from uh, the Guardian project had grappled with the uh, situation that there, were, there was no real privacy browser for uh, the Android device and developed Orfox. But we finally were able to uh, um, take them off, uh, take off the work for them and uh, deliver a proper Tor browser to uh, Android users. And as you can see, this is not, not just a copy from the desktop version, in case you already tried the desktop version. Um, it's, together with our UX team, a new design for, specific for the Android platform. And it has been a huge collaborative effort from uh, different teams within uh, the Tor project to get this uh, project going and having a Tor browser for mobile. Um, that's not been the only uh, user interface improvements we made for Tor Browser 8.5. <clears throat> we have as well redone our toolbar, which is a pretty important thing in the browser because you have all these shortcuts on them and see easily status of uh, different um, um, extensions and, and stuff you have installed. So if you compare the, um, the upper one, the upper toolbar, um, this is from Tor Browser 8, and the below one is from Tor Browser 8.5. You see that um, we removed the, uh, uh, the icons in the, uh, in the upper right. Those were from, uh, from extensions we shipped with Tor Browser, which is NoScript and HTTP is everywhere. And it's pretty confusing to users. What are they supposed to do with those uh, icons? Um, if you click on them, you're getting even more confused because then you're already in the settings dialog and you don't know as a normal user what you're supposed to do there. So it's not really 
informative having those icons there and they are just taking uh, precious space on your toolbar. So we remove them. If there are experienced users with, um, uh, with, with some uh, use cases which are not covered by the defaults, it's easy for them to drag them on the toolbar again and uh, using them as they were used to. And while we are doing, um, we moved the, the tour button icon to the right and added a, um, a shield icon, which is meant for giving easy access to the um, security settings, which allow you to make some trade-offs between um, improved security in your Tor browser and uh, features on the web, which, which could be dangerous in some contexts. And another big feature here is that you have the state of your security settings uh, visible in your toolbar. You don't have to click an, into different menus anymore to see what uh, uh, security setting you currently are on. So that's been another uh, important collaborative effort with the um, UX team. And um, that's not just to, to give you a pretty user interface. There's a, a deeper point here in the sense that um, you get more users um, if you provide them with a user interface they are used to. And uh, they make less mistakes if they use those user interfaces than uh, those you ship and are not really um, in line with what they are expecting when they are using a browser, for instance. And more users uh, in turn means it's good for your anonymity set, for your anonymity network, because there's a larger crowd uh, which uh, you can hide in as a, as a user. So a key point to take away here is um, the usability improvements we are doing and which are yet to come uh, are not just meant to give you eye candy. They are really an integral part in uh, providing anonymity to uh, as much people as possible. So what's, what's up next? So up next is Tor Browser 9, which is um, supposed to be based on Firefox 68 ESR, which is a um, special flavor of Firefox. So some of you might know that Firefox is um, coming in uh, at least uh, depends on how one, how one counts, at least two flavors. There's a normal one where you have like Firefox 68, 69, 70, and so on. And then there's the special one originally made for enterprise environments, which, which are struggling with updating their Firefox user base so quickly, because those releases get out every six to eight weeks. So Mozilla um, made a special series for those uh, needs, uh, which means that you only get security updates every six to eight weeks. And um, there's one uh, big uh, update you, made, you make like once a year. Um, and on this train, Tor Browser is based on because we have to redo our patches, which uh, are like uh, 200 or 150 and doing this every six to eight, eight weeks seemed to be infeasible um, yet. So this is um, uh, the, the big new thing, which uh, means that Tor Browser 9 will be based on the new Firefox ESR. We will have a um, improved user interface in the browser, um, meaning that it's easier to select bridges from within the browser. It's more integrated with the network settings as it's right now you will get a, um, easy access to uh, new features in the toolbar, which means like new identity, which gives you, if you press this button, um, a clean slate, a clean new session, which you can start serving without bothering whether there are still cookies and things left from the previous session. Um, and this is released, um, probably released in October later this year. So a bit longer in the, in the future, we plan to move away from uh, the Firefox ESR to the regular one. So I, I said there are some, uh, some benefits from being on the Firefox ESR train, like we don't have to rebase uh, our patches every six to eight weeks and have the uh, um, quality control which comes with that every six to eight weeks, but there are disadvantages as well. 
One of those is that there is no ESR for mobile. And as you recall, we have a mobile browser for Android now, so we have to do something here. And the plan is to first start moving away from the ESR train to the regular Firefox release for mobile, uh, test this, figure out what we need and um, what is probably um, needs to get fixed in our processes, and then um, we plan to move uh, to this new uh, away from ESR for desktop as well, because there is an argument to be made that being on the Firefox ESR um, is not giving you all the security improvements you want to have. So Mozilla's policy right now is backporting just uh, high security bugs or uh, critical bug fixes. But there are sometimes a ton of moderate bug fixes we might want to have as Tor browser users as well. And um, we want to have those too, but without, without Mozilla noticing, uh, notifying us that there is this kind of stuff we want to backport. Because we might um, miss things, um, and there's an additional argument to be made that in general, these kind of uh, ESR series are not as secure as the uh, regular ones because you don't have so many people looking at the ESR code anymore because everyone is just looking at the latest one. Uh, so there, is, there are bigger chances that you miss uh, severe bugs in, uh, in those ESR uh, series. And we will get uh, improved usability and performance improvements quicker and um, this uh, aims at uh, retaining users and getting more users to a Tor browser. So, thanks. Um, hello there. I'm uh, George, and together with Alex over there, we're working on the network team of Tor. The network team is basically um, the team which is responsible for um, like safekeeping the Tor network, kind of writing the code that implements the Tor protocol, and kind of making sure that the network is healthy and the protocol is secure, and that the code is not uh, a huge spaghetti mess. And we're basically uh, working on a huge code base, the Tor code base. It's written in C, and we have also started doing stuff in Rust. And um, right now I'm going to talk to you about the work we did over the past year. And after this, I'm going to talk to you about the work we're going to be doing next. Um, so one cool thing we did about a year ago, last summer, is that we released the tool for Onion services and also clients, which is a Python program which you can enable and it will give you uh, advanced protection against attacks like guard discovery and various kind of uh, like traffic analysis attacks. Uh, in particular, um, you can get it from GitHub and enable it on your Onion service or client, and it will try to block certain attacks and also give you like warnings if it sees certain kinds of like suspicious patterns. Um, it's still an experimental thing, and I ask you to install it if you care about the security improvements. And it's mostly like an experiment that if we see, if we see it working well, we will eventually port things into upstream Tor. Uh, so that's a cool security thing we did. Um, so another thing that's been happening, particularly this year, is that... Um, like, th there is certain uh, denial of service attacks going on on the network right now. Uh, we don't know the exact nature of them, given that we're like an anonymity network. But what we know is that uh, people are attacking each other, and particularly Onion services, uh, by pretty much spamming them with uh, requests. And this is causing lots of uh, chaos on the network. Uh, and it has two effects. One effect is damaging the network because um, all this traffic is causing too much um, like activity and overloading the relays. And the relays drop stuff and they retry. And like a whole circle of, of chaos occurs. So this is one thing. And the other is that the services are unavailable. So since the start of this year, we've been looking into this and doing tests and trying to figure out uh, defenses. And we have done a pretty good job at like, kind of 
like improving the situation of damage on the network and by doing like rate limiting or blocking uh, one hop uh, requests, we are kind of much more gentle to the network now under attack scenarios. And we're also kind of looking into like uh, improvements that would allow uh, services to have better availability when they're under attack. But this is a pretty hard thing to do um, in an anonymous network because like um, in the normal internet, you have companies like Cloudflare, which are, get like million dollars and they basically do denial of service um, um, protection using captchas or like uh, reputation based stuff and in Tor we don't have a reputation because it's like anonymous so we don't have much memory in the network so it's um it's a hard job uh like like uh distinguishing the good clients from the bad we have a few ideas particularly application level stuff but uh, if you if you're in this uh, like business and you have ideas on how to move forward please come and see us um, so another cool thing that's happening is that um, um, uh, like a few years ago a research project came out which is called WTF pad and it's supposed to um, protect uh, Tor, Tor, Tor clients from uh, um, certain website fingerprinting attacks or other types of traffic analysis and what this research project was doing is introducing padding which is fake traffic into the circuits so by adding some sort of smart padding on the circuits you could kind of make things blend more together and kind of like confuse the adversary into not knowing what's going on so we went ahead and implemented this uh, like adaptive uh, configurable padding thing into Tor um, and it's enabled right now since uh, like a few months ago. Uh, basically what's going on is that we have enabled two padding machines. They're basically like state machines that kind of specify how padding should be done. And their aim is to um, like obfuscate whether an onion service client, a client who visits an onion service, is actually visiting onion services or doing real, tra real like website traffic. And we're still looking into this because this like blending in with other circuits is kind of um, hard in such a chaotic environment, but uh, we're doing research and we have like motivated more researchers into, into using this, uh, uh, this framework. Um, we've also been working on improving uh, the mobile support. Uh, this means that like, we have better integration with Android now. Um, we're better, we, now you can build Tor as a library and you can like, integrate it easier with third party applications. And we have also introduced like a dormant mode, which is like a special mode that Tor goes in when it, uh, it's not used and it needs to like relax and stop like using bandwidth or battery. <coughs> and basically, like if you, if you have uh, Tor deactivated or like uh, on your mobile and you forgot about it, it's not gonna like uh, spam the network with requests. It's just gonna like relax a bit and when you need it next, it's gonna activate again. So now I'm going to talk to you about the things that we have planned for the future, uh, particularly this upcoming year. So one huge project that is happening on Tor and also on a, like a whole project um, level and not just on the network team is that um, there is lots of people and projects and browsers and whatnot that are interested in like playing with Tor and integrating it into their product. And they want some sort of guarantee that Tor is going to work under different scenarios and under different level of users and all that. And right now, our metrics and our performance evaluations are kind of hacky, let's say. So one big thing we're doing, and we're applying for funding for this and trying to like go serious in this, is take a look in performance in a serious way and try to understand what kind of performance currently Tor provides and what kind of performance 
currently users expect and how to improve this and how to like measure this over time based on events and on how many users get in and a new browser user store, how does that affect performance? And we're also like planning to uh, play with, uh, for example, moving to a datagram transport and uh, practicing other types of congestion control or we have uh, implemented a new bandwidth scanner, which basically like measures how much um, uh, bandwidth each relay has. And we use this for load balancing, but we're experimenting with new ones to see how that works out. And in general, we expect that this is something that is going to take lots of our time in the future to kind of be able to provide a more consistent and scalable tour in the future. Um, and also we have funding for onion services for many months uh, forward and we plan to do certain improvements on them along with the ones we've already done. Um, one pretty good one is that we plan to port onion balance which is currently only supports the old onion services. We plan to like uh, revamp it and uh, do support for v3 onion services which is something that uh, lots of people are asking us for and it's basically one of the major ways to provide a big onion service right now. And another thing that we've been thinking about a lot is that um, we have uh, problems with the usability of onion services and the fact that the onions are super long and the names are super long. And we are thinking about how to improve this, particularly with the new onion services that are like 56 characters long. And we plan to like experiment with um, HTTPS everywhere to blend onions into it to provide some sort of like smart bookmark system which you can share with other people as a like a, a temporary solution for now and as we go forward we're looking at like more advanced naming systems and more secure and smart stuff to kind of integrate them with Tor. And we've also been working on like a the anti-censorship uh, level and trying to uh, improve the pluggable transport specification and make it more integratable with other um, like uh, projects and make it more versatile and we've been doing lots of improvements around anti-censorship in general and this is what Alex is gonna talk to you about now. Thank you. So my name is Alex. I'm usually part of the same team that George is on, namely the network team, which is responsible for the core part of uh, the Tor network daemon. Um, in, middle, in the middle of 2018, we realized that usually the network team were responsible for the anti-censorship part of uh, the organization, but we didn't really have time for it and we didn't prioritize it high enough. So what we did was that we created a dedicated anti-censorship team. We had a hiring round where we hired two people and a small amount of the network team joined in on the anti-censorship team to sort of get it started. Um, the idea with the anti-censorship team is that they're going to fight the thing you can see here, namely the censorship we see in various uh, regimes around the world, different countries. Some of these are from the Middle East, but there's also one of them that contains one from Denmark. It's practically the same system, it's just used in uh, different tuning parameters and how much they're being used. Um, so, the big thing we have here is that we generally know that OPS4 seems to be working. It works for many users around the world, but one of the problems for it is to get access to reliable bridges. These bridges are the ones that people um, need to put up in their Tor configuration or via the browser to get it running. Um, we also know that domain fronting, which is the technique where you sort of establish a TLS connection into one of the big public clouds with, uh, where you set an SNI header to, for example, uh, a big site that, that the sender is unlikely to block, and then you make an HTTP request inside of it with a different host header where the uh, load balancer at the edge of the cloud will route you to the right customer, which then happens to be someone from the Tor project who's running a bridge. One of the problems with the, the domain fronting uh, pluggable transport that we have that's called Meek is that it's incredibly expensive to operate. Uh, for people who are familiar with Tor, they will know that sort of the ingoing traffic is the same as the outgoing traffic when you were running a relay, which means we have to pay for all this traffic that's going in and out of the, uh, of the clouds. This is something we would, uh, we would really like to, to like, deal with. This 
uh, means that we're continuing the efforts to generally make it easier for people to get access to bridges. One of the things we did uh, recently in the last year is that we integrated a something called Moat. Um, Moat is a system where uh, you access BridgeDB over a domain-fronted connection directly in the UI of the Tor browser. So people who are not familiar with BridgeDB, BridgeDB is the system that people who are in censored areas have to access to get access to these bridge lines that you put in the configuration. This has generally been a difficult thing for some people to get access to. You have to solve a CAPTCHA first. You have to go to a website. We also have different entry points to it. So you can, for example, send an email to a Gmail account. We will then reply with an automated system with these bridge lines. But now it's integrated directly in the browser. So when Tor starts up, for the majority of people here in Germany, when you use Tor, it's mostly about the anonymity and the anti-tracking features you get from it. But for some people in other parts of the world, it's about reachability. So for them, it's not the same thing. When they start Tor, they normally don't connect to the network because all the entry points to the network is uh, censored. So having this UI directly in the browser uh, generally makes it much easier for people to get access to it. They now have to solve the capture inside of the browser instead of going to a separate website, solve it there, get the lines, copy them into the browser, and then being able to connect. So this is a very good step in the right direction for the UX of getting access to bridges. So I mentioned uh, before that we have Meek, which is the domain fronting technique that generally seems to be working very well, but it's very expensive to operate. Um, one of the big things the new anti-censorship team has been working on, together with the uh, BridgeDB improvement and so on, is a pluggable transport called Snowflake. The general idea about Snowflake is that you do, um, we have a client inside the centered area. Uh, what it does is that it does a domain-fronted request to a broker, which could be seen a little bit like a, a, a more fancy way of having a BridgeDB. Uh, what the broker responds with is um, a token, which is the connection identifier from one of the Snowflake proxies that exist on the uncensored part of the internet. These proxies are running in people's web browser, people like you in here. You can go to this website, download the web extension in your uh, Chrome or Firefox browser. And what you're doing is that you're practically providing access for people to enter the Tor network using your web browser. So your web browser becomes sort of a mini uh, Tor relay without actually all the features of the normal Tor relay. This is a good system for us in that it has significantly less cost because the data is going via a lot of people. We distribute sort of the load of the traffic out to multiple people's uh, web browsers. And the only domain-fronted uh, data we need to exchange is the initial request from the client to the broker, and then the broker's response, and then we are done having any connections between that. So it's a very limited, it's just a small uh, string that's being exchanged. What uh, your web browser will be doing is that it uses a WebSocket connection to a specific bridge uh, that is currently running, and from the bridge on, you, the uh, user will be able to connect to their final destination, which is the uh, Tor network in this sense. But it's designed like a pluggable transport, so there are certain other organizations that are providing systems that are compatible with these pluggable transport, and they will be, using, be able to use the Snowflake system as well with slight modifications. But you can go to the website and check it out. It's a very cool project, and it's still sort of in development. We're coming to the end of this presentation, but we have a few things we would like to say. Um, people in here are probably very familiar with that uh, Tor works like a, like a typical sort of research organization and as a nonprofit. So what we do is that we sit down twice a year, discuss what we would like to do over the upcoming year, and then we have a grant writing team that needs to make sure that we get some money. Um, these uh, grants make sure that we can do the general features, the big features we would like to do, but there's a lot of things that, first of all, we cannot find grants for to do, like things we would love to do. And there are also certain things that just shows up. For example, one of the things that George was talking about, about the DOS, we had in December 2018 a very, um, there was a very high uh, performance degradation in the network. That was not something we had planned for, so that is where, uh, when we get donations, these money are being spent for developers' hours to fix these things when they come up, these things that we like, cannot foresee. We're going to have this Bug Smash Fund here in August. Um, the idea is that uh, people donate money to us, and we have some of the bugs that we find interesting that we would really like to solve, but that we haven't been able to find uh, funding for over a longer period of time. 
this money will go directly to developer hours to, to sort these things out. So do donate. So one of these things is, uh, how can you help with the Tor project? Um, we're generally trying to separate the network from like the organization. We have a certain overlap of things, but generally everyone in this room should be able to run a, a, a Tor relay or a bridge if you want to do that. We recently had made a relay guide to make it easier for people to get started operating and running relays. Um, that is one thing you can do, or you can also help run a bridge. We're going soon to have a campaign about getting more uh, ops for bridges uh, as part of the anti-censorship team goals, um, because right now we have a lot of ops for proxies that are not really working, so we could really use some more of those. Um, one thing we have done recently is that, uh, as Gus also mentioned, with the website translations and so on, all our applications these days are getting translated using this uh, central system we have. We could really use help with getting people to translate our stuff. Both website and our applications are in need of having active maintainers to translate them. And as mentioned, you can donate uh, to us, which is uh, very much appreciated, and we will also send some, uh, send some swag to you if you do that. One thing we're changing now is that we're going to uh, differentiate a little bit uh, between one-time donors and uh, recurring donors. And the recurring donors are going to receive more uh, goods if they, if they continue to donate to the project. We have a small booth here at uh, the CCC camp um, at the About Freedom Village. You can go by uh, probably a little bit after the event, but uh, at some point during the day. You can donate and get t-shirts, and we also have some stickers if you are very interested in that. We have time for some questions now. Um, and once we're done, if people are not comfortable with uh, doing questions here, we'll go outside and people can come and ask us questions. Thank you. All right, so if you have questions for Gecko, Goose, Alex, or George, please queue up here at the microphones. Um, do we have a question over there? Do we have some questions? I'm sure that we have some questions. Come on, guys. Maybe people want to do them outside. It is too hot in here. Could that yeah. be the case? <laughs> it is too hot. So, do we have anything from, from outside the tent, from the net? No, we don't. There we have the first question. Please shoot ahead. Um, are there any independent TAR networks, like uh, decentralized, like in running using your TAR? Not, not all connected to one TAR. We can't really hear you. Can you get closer to the microphone and, and, and ask a question again? Sorry about this. Are there any independent TAR networks in installed running? Any what? Oh, no. Um, so, we, uh, not, not to my knowledge, do you guys know if we have any independent Tor networks that are not operated by like, the normal official network? We have a test network, but that's operated by us as well, so that doesn't uh, get the uh, independent label. Any more questions? It would be... Well, queue up in the microphone, please. Here we go. Um, how do you measure the traffic over the network? Is this also included the uh, fake traffic you generate by yourself to make more entropy? Or is it just traffic entering the network and so user traffic? So all relays, uh, the nodes of the network, actually report statistics about the traffic that goes through them um, every day. Um, I think that also includes the padding traffic by default. I think there are plans in the future to kind of distinguish these two so that we can see how much padding overhead we have over the network. But I think we don't have that right now. I think so. I'm not sure. And an additional question, technically the Snowflake uh, solution with uh, WebRTC, it's a first step for censored clients. Uh, how this is different to the classical solution? So you still have to provide a 
a signaling server for the WebRTC client that you get the so WebRTC connection. So what is different with this server? You have to provide the signaling server and still this server can be blocked. Right. How, how um, does it work? So, so the general game you play when you're doing the uh, anti-censorship arms race is that uh, these censors usually don't want too much sort of collateral damage. So by by, we are sort of exploiting a little bit the sort of centralization that's happening on the internet right now where so many sites are hosted by Amazon, Google, uh, and Microsoft. And by using IP addresses in their IP space and doing the domain fronting part, we generally start playing a game where um, the, uh, the sensor will need to block the whole area of, of the IP space for these uh, public clouds. Uh, just, just like we do with, with Meek in practice. The people who are running the Snowflake proxies, that is the small lightweight installations in the uh, web browser, should generally not be in areas where there's censorship, because that is the place where you can block the access to the uh, central bridge, which is the access point to the Tor network. Did that explain? Thank you. So we do have a new questions over there. C could you make use of the monitor here that we might hear the question? Hi, hi guys. Um, I remember last year Google and, uh, and, and then Amazon announced they were going to be prohibiting domain fronting, but I, I saw in your talk that you said that domain fronting is still working pretty well. Could you spend a minute or two sort of describing sort of the, the current status of domain fronting, which providers are still allowing it, which ones are prohibiting it, and like how is it working if two of the biggest companies have said they're not going to allow it anymore? Right. Um, that is definitely a big problem. I think we are only having one entry point right now with, with Meek. Am I right about that? Which I think is Microsoft. Um, Amazon and Google does not do it. So there are other options we can use there. Domain fronting is a general technique, and the one we explained here was the, uh, where we cheat with the TLS uh, SNI header. Um, for example, uh, Amazon also has their simple queuing service, which is a central endpoint that all applications that integrates with those will use. Uh, using that, you can do sort of request response applications using, uh, using Amazon, which is, I, I would say, a more uh, legitimate way of, uh, of, of using their service, whereas the other thing, we're sort of exploiting the difference between how web servers uh, handle TLS versus the HTTP header. So that is one thing we're investigating right now. The other one is uh, the ESNI, which is, uh, if people are familiar with uh, Cloudflare's work on, on this, uh, ESNI is one of those uh, proposed standard. I'm not sure it's a standard yet, but it, it's an idea where you uh, start encrypting SNI, but it generally works best if, if you have many websites on, on a single server or a, as a single provider. There are some things we can do there that we're experimenting with right now, but they're still missing uh, support for these in the big uh, TLS libraries. Was that uh, good enough? Awesome. All right. So, by the looks, nobody is queuing, therefore we're going to close that over here. Gecko, Gus, Alex and George, thank you very much for the update on The Onion, and that is your applause. Thank you.